Welcome to this lecture on English language. Today's topic is Indian Weavers by Sarojini Naidu. Sarojini Naidu is well known as the Nightingale of India and she was a renowned poet and politician. She was also the first woman president of Indian National Congress and she has the rare distinction of being the governor of the state of Bengal after independence. Now this particular poem is a beautiful poem which is all about the different stages of human life. It is a short poem and it consists of three stanzas of four line each. Now what is the central idea of the poem? The central idea is that God, he is the master weaver. Who is a weaver? One who weaves. Bun, bunkar ko kehte hai, weaver. So, God is the master weaver and he weaves the web of life. And the web of life has different colors. When you, speak, when you say that it has different colors, it means that life is a mixture of the good and the bad experiences. <coughs> So it gives a very symbolic picture of man's journey from birth to death. And Indian weavers, they weave at three times of day. Now this particular poem, it is an account of the various stages of human life. And with the help of symbols, you know, it explains the different, uh, the, symbols, the symbols used in this poem is that of time and color. So with the symbols of color, with the symbol of time, it explains the three stages, the three important stages of human life. So it is a discussion between the poet and the weaver. So of course the literary uh, devices, they include simile, imagery and metaphor. Now we start with, with the poem. Weavers weaving at the break of day. Now the poet he introduces the weavers that they begin their day, yes, with weaving, the break of day. It is suggestive of a stage of life. Now, what is the stage of life that it is suggesting? It is suggesting the young age. And so, why do weaver, uh, weaver weave a garment so gay? So, the, there is a conversation between the poet and the weaver. And the poet asks the weaver as to what and why they are weaving. So the first two lines, it consists the question. And the second two line, it consists the answer. So the first two line is weavers weaving at the break of day. So the, uh, the poet asks as to why they are weaving the cloth, yes, at the break of day. Break of day means the, it is dawn, in the morning. <coughs> The weavers reply, blue as the wing of a halcyon wild. Now hal halcyon is a bird. So the what color um, of I mean, uh, the color of the cloth which they are weaving is blue. It is as it is beautiful and it is a beautiful blue like that of the wings of halcyon halcyon wild. Now halcyon wild is a bird. It is also known as the kingfisher. We weave the robes of a newborn child and so they are so happy at it. Why? Because it is the break of day and the break of day we are all very fresh. The weavers are also very fresh. Why? Because they are weaving a beautiful garment of a newborn child. So this is the first stage of life that the poetess she describes. So the weaver is also very happy in weaving the, 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 the cloth, the garment for the child. Next is weaves, weavers weaving solemn and still. What do you weave in the moonlight chill? White as a feather and white as a cloud, we weave a dead man's funeral shroud. Sorry, I'm sorry, we've missed one uh, stanza. Weavers weaving at the fall of night. The second stanza, again the poet asks the weavers as to what and why they are and now the poet approaches the weaver at the fall of night. What is fall of night? Fall of night means it is dusk, it is evening. So it is evening time that the poet asks the weavers as to what they are presently weaving. So weavers weaving at the fall of night, why do you weave a garment so bright? Now remember 
the second stanza in the second stanza the weaving of the cloth the cloth appears very bright why it is bright like the plumes of a peacock purple and green the color of the cloth is purple and green now more colors have been added it is again symbolic what is it symbolic that with the advancement of age this this stanza it speaks about the adult age the adulthood and with adulthood comes many experiences you know the the, the experiences they become varied and there are they, are they become more in number so like the plumes of a peacock purple and green so the weaver replies to the poet that they are weaving a uh, they are weaving the veil of a queen yes because it is adulthood so obviously it is uh, it is the age when uh, human beings get married so and indians and indian marriages are mostly they are uh, solemnized at night so that is why the 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 phase of time the period of time is mentioned fall of night yes so in the evening they are weaving the marriage gown the marriage veil of a queen and what color it is it is uh, peacock and purple now peacock and purple they are symbolic of uh, the ease the, uh, the happiness and struggle both so adulthood is a it is a mixture of experiences good and bad weavers weaving solemn and still what do you weave in the moonlight chill now in the third stanza the poet asks approaches the weavers and the peed the point of time the period of time is moonlight chill that is it is the dead night and what happens in dead night it is very very chill white as a feather and white as a cloud now the color of the uh, cloth which they are weaving is white now what is it suggestive of it is the suggest it is suggestive of old age right feather and white as a cloud we weave a dead man's funeral shroud so in the third stanza the weavers they are weaving a shroud what is a shroud it is a covering for the dead body and what color is it is it is white so it has become see all the colors have vanished and now yes life is colorless right why because it is the approach of death with the approach of death yes all colors vanish all emotions vanish and the writer highlights that it is the end of life so vividly the three stages of life have been have been um, described in these three stanzas so sarojini naidu she tells us about the three stages of life that human beings have to pass now some of the multiple choice questions are here the lesson indian weaver is a poem by of course the answer is sarojini naidu the poem is about weavers weaving yes different times of the day different kinds of cloth neither a nor b both a and b so it is both a and b so there are similar uh, questions given uh, halison is a blue colored bird right so blue is suggestive of happiness joy it is very precious the, it is it, it it signifies um, a life which is very precious so these symbolisms with, with this help of symbolism the poet explains about the three stages of life yes the uh, see life is all about happiness it begins at the at the time of birth yes life is all about happiness and when life ends it is all about about sorrow and grief similarly when the life begins yes it is uh, it is more it is uh, you know uh, brightness and with the uh, approach of uh, night the midnight chill yes what happens is death overpowers man and renders him emotionless so this is all about this poem now we start with the next poem and that is solitary reaper by william wordsworth the full name of wordsworth was william wordsworth i have already mentioned and his poetic career, uh, career spanned about 60 years he is also called a lake poet now what do you mean by lake poet he belonged to the lake district of england and so why that's why he was called lake poet he uh, is a romantic 
poet. Now, romantic poet means he belongs to the romantic age which spanned between 800 to 1850. He was a great worshipper of nature. He's uh, very uh, aptly called, he's commonly referred to as a high priest of nature. And uh, he believed that there was a divine spirit in nature. And he also said, he also upheld the fact that uh, uh, man experiences joy in the company of nature. And nature, he said, has a healing force. And so he considers nature as a moral preacher. So he was a high priest of nature. He was a great adorer of nature. He adored and worshipped nature. Now this, these are some of the works which he has written. Right now, we begin with the solitary reaper. The solitary reaper. This poem it was written in uh, on fifth November eighteen not five, and it was published in eighteen not seven. Uh, it appeared in the collection titled Memories of a Tour in Scotland, and the poet, along with his sister, they had two toured Scotland in eighteen not three, and stayed at a village where they. Uh, uh, he, where he, uh, Wordsworth wrote this poem. Now, what is this poem? It is first of all, it is written in first person, and it, it is it consists of thirty-two lines, and it is a pastoral poem. What is a pastoral poem? A pastoral poem is a poem which has a rural setting, right? It describes the scene of the countryside. And uh, uh, when we read the lines, we will understand it more that it, it is the scene opens and a, a girl, a highland girl is singing. Right now, solitary reaper, now, what this title, it is suggestive, very suggestive. Solitary means alone and a reaper is one who gathers grains. Right now, we start with the poem, behold her. Now the poet draws the attention of the reader to the highland lass, right? Lass, now single in the field. Highland is a mountainous region of Scotland. And the mountainous regions are called highland. And in that highland, a, a, a lass, you know, what do you mean by lass? Lass is actually, uh, it is a word for girl in Scot. The Scottish language, Re, uh, reaping and singing by herself, stop here or gently pass. So, the poet draws the attention of the reader. Why? Because he is greatly enchanted by the melodious singing, yes, of that little girl. She sings so beautifully that he wants the readers and the passers by to enjoy the melody of that song. And he fears that he should not be disturbed. He is very, he is so enamored. He is so uh, fascinated by the melody singing that he wished to be undisturbed by, by the readers and by the passers by. So reaping and sing singing by herself. So he describes what she is doing in that highland, in that mountainous region of Scotland. What is she doing? She is reaping. She is. Yes, she is reaping means she is gathering the grains, yes, and she is going on singing. Alone she cuts and binds the grain. See this term alone, solitary, yes, singing alone. This again and again, you know, the poet tells that she is all alone. Yes, alone she cuts and binds the grain and sings a melancholy strain. So she is singing so beautifully. And from the tone, from the sound of a song, from the melody of the song, uh, Wordsworth infers, he concludes that perhaps she is singing a very sad song. Oh, listen, for the wail profound is overflowing with the sound. So he says her be the, the melodious notes of her singing. It is filling the valley, the entire region, the mountainous region, the valleys, yes, the meadows, all are full with the, it is, re, they are reverberating, they are echoing with the melodious notes of the melodious singing of that last.
No nightingale did ever chant more welcome notes to weary bands of travelers in some shady haunt among Arabian sands. Now, this pad in this stanza, he makes two comparisons, right? He first compares her to a nightingale. Nightingale is a sweet voiced bird. It sings beautifully and it is known to be singing in the Arabian deserts. Now, Arabian deserts may, what happens is that the travelers, you know, after the day long traveling, they look for a shady uh, patch and they, they, uh, you know, they take rest under shrubby area, in, in the shrubby areas or what you called oasis. Oasis bolte hai usko. So, they take rest under the shrubby areas and they're so uh, tired after day long traveling. So, Nightingale suits them with her melodious and welcomes them with her melodious song. So, the writer Wordsworth here, he says that the singing of the Lars is more beautiful than the melodious singing of Nightingale, right? So, this is what it means of more welcome notes to very band. So, whoever listens to the melodious singing of this highland Lars, will be relieved of all their stress. She is, her singing is more melodious than the singing of the nightingale who welcomes tired, wearied travelers in the Arabian deserts. So this is the first comparison he makes. Yes, the, uh, the last is singing with nightingale. A voice so thrilling never was heard in springtime from the cuckoo bird breaking the silence of the seas among the farthest Hebrides. Now, next comparison is with cuckoo. Now, cuckoo is also a very sweet voiced bird. Now, what does, where does this uh, cuckoo, it is a springtime, it, it, it is a springtime bird and it sings full throatedly in during the springtime. And uh, here he gives a beautiful imagery to explain in springtime from the cuckoo bird breaking the silence of the sea. Now, you know, this uh, Hebrides is actually, it is a group of islands. Now, Great Britain, Scotland ki baat nikli thi. Scotland is a part of uh, Great Britain. United Kingdom and Great Britain, they are two different things. Great Britain actually, it is a combination. It is, it, it consists of England, Scotland and Wales, right? And when you, when you uh, use this United Kingdom, it includes the Northern Ireland also and other islands. So basically United Kingdom is an archipelago and Hebrides is an, it's also an island, yes, in United Kingdom and it is considered to be the extreme end of the world and it is a group of 500 islands. So Hebrides, the sea near the Hebrides, yes, and uh, it is very, it is very, very peaceful. Uh, I'll, we'll take a short break and we'll resume the class. The cuckoo bird is also a very sweet voiced word and its melodious singing is mostly heard near the, in the, in the, the ocean, yes, on the islands of Hebrides. So, the Lars' singing is more thrilling and more melodious than the cuckoo's singing. So, this is the comparison he makes in this particular stanza, that the girls, the young maiden's song is more beautiful than, it is more melodious than nightingale and that of cuckoo. Will no one tell me what she sings? Now, this girl, she is singing in a very different language. There are so many languages in United Kingdom, right? So she is singing in a language which the word, which Wordsworth is not able to understand. So, will no one tell me what she sings? So he, he tells us that he is unable to understand what she is singing, right? He's not, he, he's not able to understand what, on what theme she is singing. Perhaps the plaintive numbers flow for old, unhappy, far off things. <coughs> when he says perhaps, it means that he is going to guess. 
yes, he will speculate that she is perhaps singing plaintive numbers. What is plaintive numbers? Plaintive means sad. Sad singing is called sang song. Sad songs are called plaintive numbers. For old unhappy far off things. So, these songs are about yes, the old the past uh, ab about uh, things which have happened in the past. Yes, and battles long ago. Perhaps she is singing about the battles which have been fought in distant lands. So, this is the guesses that he is making. Why? Because she is he is not able to understand the language in which she is singing. She is singing in uh, uh, the, the language is Scotic, uh, you know, it is a Scottish language and which uh, Wordsworth is unable to understand and comprehend. Or is it some more humble lay? And further, he keeps guessing about the theme of the song. And presently, he thinks perhaps she is singing about, about the humble lay, about the people, about the common man, about the common occurrences, yes, of about the common day to day occurrences, familiar matter of today, familiar matter of today is daily happenings, some natural sorrow, loss or pain or she, she is perhaps singing about the loss which she has suffered. Yes, she has suffered some loss uh, from or some pain, yes or some sorrow which she has, which she is yes giving vent to through her singing that has been and may be again. So, again he is not able to understand what the theme of the song is. Whatever the theme of the maiden song, yes as if her song could have no ending. He says he is not, he is I mean the, uh, he is not very keen to know about the theme of the song. Why? Because the melody of the song is such that it, it has fascinated him. Yes, I saw her singing at her work and over the sickle bending. Yes, he keeps telling us that she is constantly working. She is constantly working and she is going on singing incessantly. Incessantly means without stopping she is singing and she is working, she is reaping and she is singing at the same time. I listened motionless and still and as I mounted up the hill, the music in my heart I bore. So, such was the impact of her singing that he the, the song which he has listened I mean the heard uh, yes from that girl is so impactful that it still lingers in his heart even after leaving that leaving that place. The music in my heart I bore long after it was heard no more. He mounted the hill, he climbs the hill, he returns to his native place and he returns to his hometown and after returning also that song he is able to you know it keeps haunting him and he can still hear in the recess of his heart. So, that is what is saying long after it was heard no more. So, he has gone away from the scene from the, from the place where she was singing and after even after leaving that place he is able to he is able to re uh, recollect uh, yes the melody of that song he still hears the melody of her singing in the recess of his heart such was the impact of the melodious singing of that highland lass right so we conclude this particular uh, uh, poem and that we have all, all uh, already known that yes he tells us about i mean solitude is the dominant theme and he also tells us about the about the uh, you know the the what do you call the enchanting impact of music and art that can ennoble the feelings of human heart the next chapter is portrait of a lady by kushwan singh now kushwan singh was a is a was a well known novelist lawyer journalist and politician right he is a writer of trenchant secularism, humor and sarcasm. He was a prolific writer who had written many works and for which he was awarded Padma Bhushan in 1974. <coughs> now, this particular lesson is about, it is, gives a very moving account of the author's close relationship with his grandmother. We all have grandmothers 
and we are very attached to our grandmother. So, the writer also he was greatly attached to his grandmother and this particular story, this particular chapter it tells us about the eternal bond yes, between grandchildren and grandparents. See, he draws a beautiful pen portrait of his grandmother and of course, the story is biographical and there are two turning points in the story. Now, we read through the lesson and understand what more he has told us about his grandmother. My grandmother like everybody's grandmother was an old woman. She had been old and wrinkled for the 20 years that I had known her. So, he describes that she is an old woman, she has a wrinkled face, right. People said that she had once been young and pretty, yes, she, her, she still looked very graceful which, which, uh, which uh, conveyed that she was a, she must have been a very beautiful lady at, in her youth and had even had a husband, but that was hard to believe. My grandfather's portrait hung above the mantelpiece in the drawing room. He wore a big turban and loose fitting clothes. So, he gives a description of his grandfather also that he wore a big turban and loose fitting clothes, right. His long white beard covered the, covered the best part of his chest and he looked at least 100 years old. So, he further describes that he had a long beard, yes, his grandfather had a long beard and perhaps he looked, the portrait it depicted, it, it reflected that he was, he must have been 100 years old. He did not look the sort of a person who would have a wife or children. He looked as if he could only have a lots and lots of grandchildren. So, he was a very great, uh, graceful grandfather and his portrait reflected that he was a very graceful man and he must have, uh, he, he had a lot of grandchildren. As for my grandmother, now he co comes back to the description of his grandmother and he tells us, as, of, as for my grandmother, being young and pretty, the thought was most revolting. She often told us of the games she used to play as a child. Every grandmother, you know, narrates to their grandchildren about their childhood. So, Kushwan Singh's grandmother also used to narrate all the happenings, all the incidents of, of her childhood. That seemed quite absurd and undignified on her part and we treated it like the fables of the prophets she used to tell us. So, she used to tell every uh, happening, every incident of her, yes, younger days, yes, uh, and it used to be such an uh, interesting narrative that it, it sounded like fables. Now, what is a fable? Fable is actually a moral stories, parables and fables. Parables are based on human characters, whereas fables, mo both are moral stories and fables, they have uh, animals as characters. So, she used to, I mean the the, the vividity with which she used to narrate, <coughs> the clarity with which she used to narrate the incidents of her life, it used to be so interesting narratives that the, uh, that her grandson uh, Kushwan Singh, he used to enjoy it fully. She had always been short and fat and slightly bent, right. Grandmother, obviously she was growing old and because of her old age, yes, there were changes in her physique also. She was short and fat and slightly bent, which means that she had a hunch. Her face was a criss cross of wrinkles. She was old and so there were so many wrinkles on her face, right. Criss cross means it, there is a, you know, where lines they, they intersect, right. The lines on the face when they intersect, they are called criss cross of wrinkles running from everywhere to everywhere. So, every inch of her face was wrinkled and it, it was a intersection of lines, a crisscross of wrinkles. No, we were certain she had always been as uh, we had known her. So, he had never seen her young, he had always seen her old and she, this she remained the same, old, so terribly old that she could not have grown older. So, he, so many wrinkles, so many wrinkles on her face which, which signified which con conveyed that she was very old and had stayed at the same age for 20 years. So, he has been seeing her perhaps, yes, and he finds that her looks were constant. She could never have been pretty, but she was always beautiful. So, in spite of her old age, in spite of her wrinkled face, she looked very, very beautiful, right? Okay. 
She always hobbled about the house in spotless white with one hand resting on her waist. What is hobbling? Yes, to you know, uh, hobbling actually it means to uh, walk, uh, you know, uh, with difficulty. That is called hobbling. So, because she is old, she used to hobble about in spotless white. So, the attire, she, he, he tells us that she used to dress up in in spotless, immaculate, right, white with one hand resting on her waist to balance her stoop and the other telling the beads of her rosary. So, she had a rosary in her hand, rosary jo hum hindi mein jab mala kehte hain. So, she had a rosary in her hand and she had a stoop. Stoop means she used to bend towards on one side, yes, because of her old age. Her silver locks were scattered untidily over her pale puckered face. Now, what is, what do you mean by this? Her silver locks. Silver locks, it means that she had gray hair. She is old and obviously, she had very gray hair and they were scattered untidily. Matlab, they were not, uh, which means that they were not uh, properly combed, yes, unkempt over her pale puckered face. She had a pale face. Puckered means, um, which has the marks of smallpox. Chechak ke daag jin ke chehre pe rehte hain, usko kehte hain, unko kehte hain puckered face. So, she had a puckered face also and her lips constantly moved in inaudible prayers. So, she had a rosary in her hand and with, on, with that rosary, she, she, uh, she kept on praying, silent prayers, right? Her lips used to move, right? Right. Yes, she was beautiful. She was like the winter landscape in the mountains. She was very beautiful, right? She was a beautiful. He describes her. This is the imagery that he uses to describe her beauty, that she was a winter landscape in the mountains, an expanse of pure white serenity, breathing peace and contentment. We have, uh, have you seen winter landscapes? What happens in winter landscapes? <coughs> it is covered with snow. Right, it looks white. So, she in her white outfits, she looked like a winter landscape. She was very beautiful, very enchanting to look at. Yes, an expanse of pure white serenity, breathing peace and contentment. So, in her white dress with her silver locks, right, puckered face, pale puckered face, right, always mumbling. Uh, inaudible prayers, right? She breathed peace and contentment. Her face reflected, it had an aura of peace and contentment. My grandmother and I were good friends. Now, all grandchildren, they are very attached to their grandmothers. So, the, po the writer also, Kushwan Singh, he was greatly attached to his grandmother. They were very good friends. My parents left me with her when they went to live in city and we were constantly together. So, his parents, they got his father, he had to move to a city. Why? Because of his posting. And so, uh, he stayed, uh, uh, Kushwan Singh, he was left to stay with his grandmother in the village. She used to wake me up in the morning and get me ready for the school. So, she used to ensure that he got up uh, early in the morning and she used to dress him, up, dress him up for the morning school. She said her morning prayers in a monotonous sing song while she bathed and dressed me in the hope that I would listen and get to know it by heart. So, even while giving him a bath, she would keep singing bhajans, devotional songs so that, yes, he also can learn. So, see, this is the care that she uses. This is the the, I mean, the good uh, habits that she was imparting to her grandson. I would listen and get to know it by heart. I listened because I loved her voice, but never bothered to learn it. He used to listen to her voice. Why? Because she had a very sweet voice and he was very fond of her, of her sweet voice. Then she would fetch my wooden slate, which she had already washed and plastered. So, she would keep his slate also ready for the school, which she had already washed and plastered with chalk. So, it used to be covered, smeared with, uh, you know, the earlier the slates had to be, had to be, uh, you know, uh, plastered with chalk. A tiny earthen ink pot and red pen tie, them all in a bundle and handed to me. So, the 
the school bag or the school box it consists of a slate of an ink pot so all these things used to be packed in a bundle and given to him by his grandmother after a breakfast of thick stale chapati with a little butter and sugar spread on it we went to school so this is the breakfast that he used to take with him right it was stale chapati and with some little, uh, little butter smeared on it yes she would also carry some chapatis with her yes the uh, yes besides the tiffin box which she used to give to her son she used to carry some more chapatis or uh, pancakes with her why we will know my grandmother always went to school with me because the school was attached to the temple yes so she would carry chapatis with her and she would always accompany her grandson to school why because she was she wanted to yes offer her prayers to the temple at the temple which was in the school campus so that is the attraction she had yes she was very fond she was very godly and so she was very fond of offering prayers to uh, offer, offering prayers in the temple so she would she would uh, uh, invariably uh, without fail she would accompany the writer to his school the priest taught us the alphabet and the morning prayer so this is the tradition of the school uh, yes the tradition of the school in which uh, kushwan singh had studied that there used to be assembly yes the assembly uh, prayer assembly morning prayers used to be offered and they they used to teach them alphabets well the children sat in rows on either side of the veranda singing the alphabets or the prayer in a chorus my grandmother sat inside reading the scriptures so the school the classes used to go on in their respective rooms and grandmother she would sit yes inside the temple and she used to spend her time reading scriptures when we had both finished we would walk ba uh, back together so when the uh, when the school ended when the classes ended yes kushwan singh would uh, accompany she used to i mean her, uh, his grandmother used to stay in the temple wait for him wait for the school to get over and whenever the and as soon as the school used to get over yes he would accompany his grandmother back home this time the village dogs would meet us at the temple door and on their return yes on their return when they returned home on the way many dogs street dogs would approach the grandmother why because she used to feed them with crumbs of the chapati which she used to carry with them they followed us to her home growling and fighting with each other for the chapatis we threw to them so till the time they reached home she would keep feeding these dogs and they would fight among themselves for the crumb when my parents were comfortably settled in the city they sent for us that was a turning point in our friendship although we had shared the same room my grandmother no longer came to school with me right now we'll resume the class after a break yes so this was the life that they had leading they were leading now a turning point comes what is a turning point a change of happenings right so what happens is that yes uh, her, his father gets transferred to the city and now he wants the father wants his his son and his mother to come to the city house as the years rolled by we saw less of each other for some time she continued to wake me up and get me ready for the school so this is the turning point that when they come to city yes the distance is between the grandmother and the grandson it increases it widens why because now he will be going to a higher school and he has also he is grown up and now she won't be Ma, you know she won't be uh, looking after his uh, little needs now he is he has grown to be a independent boy when i came back she would ask me what the teacher had taught me i would tell her english words and the little things of western science so when he returned when they when he joined the city school 
right? And when he went to the uh, school, he would return. Uh, on his return, she would inquire about the type of classes, the lessons which he has learned. And she used to be very unhappy about the various, the modern topics which were being taught to him, like the Archimedes principle, the law of gravity. So she found this very, very unspiritual. These, uh, these, uh, you know. Uh, mm, uh, topics of knowledge, she did not find them very interesting and she felt that they do not, they are not contributing to the spiritual upliftment of the child. She could not help me with her lessons. Now, because he has come into a higher lesson, she could not help uh, him with the lesson and, uh, and she, you know, um, she d did not like English schools because she felt that English schools they taught all nonsensical things. Right, and then finally he goes to the university, and then so the distances, the distance between the grandmother and the uh, grandson, it kept increasing, and slowly she uh, she began to how she has to while uh, she has to pass her time. So how did she pass her time? She used to she used to spin her she used to spend her day on the spinning wheel from sunrise uh, sunrise to sunset. She would. Uh, sit on the spinning wheel and she would recite prayers. Um, she sat in and during the day, you know, she would sit in the courtyard and she used to feed sparrows with grains. The sparrows used to come, they used to congregate in that courtyard and they used to create a bedlam. Bedlam means a lot of confusion, a lot of sound. Yes, some they were so fond of grandmother, the sparrows. They were so fond of grandmothers that they would sit on her lap. Some would sit on her shoulders, some would perch on her legs and you know she would keep feeding them. She smiled and she never shooed them away, she never drove them away. She was very kind to those small parrows who used to come to her to, for, for the feed. Now he decides to, the writer, he goes abroad for further studies. And she is very, very upset that she will be missing him, right? She will not be able to see him for some time. But uh, she, uh, you know, she uh, goes to the railway station to see him off, and she kept, she hugged him, she embraced him, and prayed for his safe return. She kissed his forehead and. Um, uh, and she kissed him on his forehead and she wish, wished him a very safe and a successful journey. But that was, that took about, he, I mean, uh, for his uh, higher studies, you know, uh, he was away for five years. And when he came back home, he, she was there at the station to receive him. And he was so happy to see her after five years and there was no change in her personality, there was no change in her. She still continued to recite prayers. She was the same, right? And, um, and she was uh, uh, all, uh, you know, she was full of uh, joy and she was full of frivolous rebukes for him. In the evening, but the day when he uh, came back, what happened was that a sudden change came over her. She became, she had a mild fever and she in spite of the fever, she kept on praying. She gathered all the women of the neighborhood and they had a musical evening. They had a musical evening and after the musical evening, she had, she was, uh, she also uh, joined the group in singing full heartedly. Uh, so what happened next morning, she was suddenly taken ill and then there was a mild fever, fever. the doctor was co called. Yes, she, that was the first day he saw that she did not pray. Yes, uh, she did not pray and in spite of her protests, you know, she, uh, she, she, she kept, uh, you know, singing and then what happened was, uh, suddenly she became very serious and she breathed her last. Now her dead body has had to be taken for funeral. So, the, when the body was being taken to the funeral, uh, you know, a, a very interesting sight was seen. The sparrows which she used to feed had come to visit, yes, her, to pay their condolences to her. 
and Kushman's um, mother immediately, Kushman's mother brought some crumbs, yes, to be given to those sparrows. Yes, this, the, I mean, he, uh, the writer describes, yes, very poignantly he describes the scene that when the dead body of uh, the grandmother was taken away, the, the sparrows, they, they didn't take a look at the grains which uh, Kushban's mother had offered them. Instead, they all flew away, right, silently. They, they were f so full of rem remorse, that is, they were so full of grief and sorrow that they didn't even taste the grain which was fed to them. They had come, they had, you know, they had come there to offer their respects to the departed soul whom they respected, revered the most. The, o the old grandmother of Kushwan Singh, you know, he, uh, of, uh, Kushwan Singh was greatly loved by the by animals like sparrows, like you know, small animals like sparrows. So this is the impact of love, the bond of love that she shared with her grandson and with the with the animals, with nature. Yes, with whom she she closely and lovingly interacted with. So this is basically, yes, the story all about that the sparrows, how sensitive they are, yes, how responsive they are to the love of grandmother, right? This is the story, it's a beautiful account of grandmother. Now some of the multiple choice questions are given, that portrait of a lady is written by Kushwan Singh. The portrait of a tel uh, uh, lady tells the story of the author, there are more questions given in the presentation, you may please go through and answer them, right? The author's grandmother was old and beautiful. Yes, it is true. Grandmother carried bits of chapati for the sparrows. Yes, it is true. The author learned about Archimedes' principle in his school. Yes, it is true. As the days passed, the author grew up becoming more close to his grandmother. No, the, uh, yes, it is, uh, it is, of course, he was close to his grandmother emotionally, but physically there was a little distance. So, uh, these are some of the short questions which are given in the uh, text, describe the author's grandmother. Now you can very well describe her physical uh, attributes and uh, of course the, her uh, spiritual activities and of course her love for animals. So, uh, he creates a pen portrait of his grandmother and this, this lesson vividly, neatly and clearly describes about his grandmother. So it is a glowing tribute to his Obisan's, glowing Obisan's glowing tribute to his grandmother whom the writer loved most. Next question is how did the author's grandmother dress him up when he was a little boy? Yes, these details are all given. So these are some of the questions which will you, when you answer, this will form the summary of the lesson. If you take these answers, Right. If you, when you write these answers, the the summary of the lesson will emerge. Who accompanied the author when he went to school? You, we all know that uh, the grandmother accompanied him. What did the priest teach the students in school? They were taught, yes, chantings and alphabets. So this is basically about the lesson. Thank you for uh, the patient listening. Goodbye. <laughs>